All right, so uh, my name is Ali Sivji. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Kaya Sivjis. I'm one of the organizers of Chicago Python. I usually talk a lot about Chicago Python since these are my uh, standard slides. Uh, we are on YouTube, as you're all aware. If you have not done so and you're still here, click the subscribe button down below. Uh, hit that bell icon, get notified of our upcoming events. Let's get started. All right, so from the top, a plugin is a software component that extends or enhances an existing program. When we have plugins, it doesn't really do anything by itself. We sort of need some software we can plug into. Web browsers, they're built with pluggable architecture and all these web browsers have a huge ecosystem of third-party developers making software for things like Adblock, password management. I have a Chrome plugin for Vim key bindings. And of course, there are a ton of uh, ton of plugins for developer tooling. I use a lot for React and like Chrome Dev Tools as well. When we have an IDE or a text editor, chances are it's probably gonna have a plugin system. So this is just a a snapshot of my VS code. Uh, I have plugins to make debugging a little bit easier. I have a plugin to improve my user experience, to interact with third-party things like Docker, like GitHub. I also use a plugin to add support for a query language. So here you can have uh, support for GraphQL. If you've ever used a media player, chances are it probably has a plugin system. So media player plugins, uh, support new file types. You can change a user interface. They call those skins. Does anybody remember those fantastic visualization plugins from Winamp from really, really back in the day? WordPress, that's a very popular content management system. It was written in PHP. It's estimated it powers 35% of the web. And yeah, WordPress is powered by plugins. There are thousands upon thousands of WordPress plugins that customize WordPress to do pretty much any kind of thing. WooCommerce is a WordPress plugin that enables e-commerce on your website. WooCommerce actually has its own plugin system, which means you can write custom plugins for a plugin. Your favorite web framework, something like Django, Flask, I don't get a chance to put the logos, but like Falcon, Pyramid, all of these ways, all of these libraries have ways that third-party libraries could customize behavior and extend functionality. We can add something like a custom middleware, custom serializer. We can have uh, custom ORM fields. PyTest is another popular library that uses plugins. Uh, that's one of the reasons people use it. You can add any kind of custom behavior during the test run. PyTest has a plugin system for you to hook into. And if you start digging into the PyTest code base, you can see that PyTest, it's built on top of a plugin management tool called Pluggy. So Pluggy uh, manages all the plugins of PyTest. It also has a hook calling system that's made specifically for PyTest. In fact, PyTest's core functionality is actually implemented as plugins. They spun out Pluggy into a separate library so you can use it for your own applications. Honestly, these are a lot. I, I'm sort of giving my first time giving this talk. Sort of have a lot of things on here. So another popular web scraping tool on Python is called Scrapey. And here you create custom scrapers, which the framework loads as runtime. And it scrapes data from a website. And that's sort of done like a plugin. Pandas also has plugins. So in Pandas, you can extend it with registering a custom accessor. So something like the DT or Geo. And they recently added extension types to add uh, new types, sort of the way they did with like how they're wrapping NumPy types. So with all of these plugin systems, there are many different benefits. That's why people use them. So we, uh, with plugin systems, third-party uh, third developers can extend your application. They don't really need to know the core functionality to do it. They don't need to know how everything works. And also, if you take a page out of PyTest's playbook, you can implement your core functionality as a plugin. But there are some trade-offs to using plugins. Like any type we use an object-oriented solution, 
it means that we have to spend a little bit more time doing design upfront. We got to know what our objects are and how they interact. With plugins, it's really hard to, well, it's not that hard, but it's like, it's harder to write core, the core application. We have to add complexity in our core application to handle these third-party plugins that uh, dynamically get entered and loaded into our system. This kind of complexity, it's really not that big of a deal because we do make things a little bit better for our uh, third-party developers. So this talk is really about designing a plugin system. So we talked about a few different types of plugin architectures, but they all really share a lot of the same common characteristics. So plugins, they are, they're loaded dynamically at runtime. This means that when the program first starts, it has no ideas what plugins are gonna be used until it actually loads them in. Plugins and the host, they need a way to talk to each other. Plugins need to be called with code. I've written plugins that communicate over something like WebSockets. There needs to be some sort of two-way communication channel. And once we have a communication channel, plugins can uh, plugins will need to register themselves with our host application. And this is done many different ways depending on the application. So some programs, they're registered plugins from a folder. So if you want to load a new plugin, just create an entry in that folder. And if this sounds familiar, this is sort of how Python works. When we pip install a library, all that code, it gets saved into our site packages. And there we can import them into our program. Other programs with plugin architecture, they might require you to be a little bit more explicit. In Django, we can use middleware plugins by explicitly, explicitly listing them in our settings.py. And this is something I actually prefer. Like I like the whole idea of explicit is better than implicit. And so once we have a communication channel, plugins are gonna need to register with the host. And then they're also gonna have to uh, have the host call this plugin. So once you register for it, you can actually specify things like, what actions do you care about? And then the host program, it's only gonna call your plugin when that certain event was triggered. So this is really part of a larger like 45 minute talk. Don't really have a lot of time to go into too many details, but I did actually uh, come up with like a live demo over the past like week or so that I just sort of wanted to walk through. That's not that way, that is that way. Cool, so let me make sure everything is sharing. Yeah, that looks good. Awesome, so we have this project uh, it's going to be a command line tool to uh, print out in version control platforms like GitHub, Bitbucket, or uh, GitLab. So we'll just go through the CLI code. So I'm just going to be using argparse to get my things. And here I'm just going to be accepting a URL, uh, parsing it, and calling my git fetcher class. Inside of my git fetcher, uh, I have some code to load my plugin. So here you can see I have a Bitbucket plugin, a, Git, a GitHub plugin, and a GitLab plugin. Uh, when I initialize this um, this class, when I pass in the re uh, pass in the URL based on the plugin, it's just going to do a check to make sure that the plugin that we registered can actually be used by that specific plugin. And then if it can, we're going to call that plug. Uh, we're just going to call something here. I'll just like sort of set our instance variable. And then at the end, we're just gonna get some stats. So let's start digging into our base plugins. And so this is my base plugin. Some people use abstract base classes to make things a little bit cleaner. I just like doing things in a very simple way without like adding a lot of overhead. Uh, so here I'm just gonna specify that my base plugin is just gonna take in a repo and it's gonna output some repo statistics. So now if we go to each of my plugins, we'll just start with, oh, let's start with GitHub. That's the one most people are familiar with. So you can sort of see that here I have a GitHub plugin. The base is uh, the parent, oh, sorry, the, uh, the parent class is the base plugin. 
And here I have a function called check. It's going to check to make sure that the domain of the URL passed in is GitHub. That's how it knows it's a GitHub uh, URL. Like, that's how it knows that it should be using this plugin. And then going out, it goes to uh, this endpoint, pulls out our repo stats, and generates sort of an object. And if we go to our GitLab plugin, it's sort of the same thing. It's like, I'm inheriting from that same parent object. I have that same check function. Here, I'm just checking against a different domain. And at the end, uh, when I'm generating stats, I'm using the, Git, uh, the GitLab API and pulling information in that context. Sort of the same way with Bitbucket. Like, it's the same code, except it's really driven for Bitbucket. And now if we go back to our driver class, here I'm like registering my plugins explicitly. And we sort of talked about this before. So you can sort of see that if you ever wanted to add maybe like a different type of like provider, maybe like, like uh, what is it, SVN releases like SVN hub, and you want to track those stats, you can just like post those things and get that as you need. Cool. Uh, so this is really just a really high level overview. I wanted to give a little bit of a talk just because we have two guests from outside of Chicago. Wanted to keep that Chicago culture going. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be giving a longer version of this talk at the Python web conference. I believe my date is going to be on June 19th. So if you're interested in learning more about plugins, uh, you can get tickets at that uh, website. Uh, but we are giving away ticket, one ticket tonight and one ticket during the main meeting. So go to this URL, fill out the form, and at the end of tonight, we're going to pick out uh, a lucky winner. Uh, that's it for me. I won't be sharing slides. This talk is sort of uh, a work in progress. You could really tell like I'm like rambling here, don't really have much of a flow. But if you do have advice on how I can present these concepts, in a way that's easier to understand, please reach out. We'll love to chat about this. But yeah, just uh, very early stages of my talk. So thanks everybody for uh, for listening. I'm just gonna clap for myself. All right, uh, so we do actually have some questions. Uh, so we have a question coming in. Are, are there any security risks with running plugins from users? Yeah, that's definitely a problem. So uh, when you do download a plugin, so say maybe for like Chrome, like that app store, it makes sure that they'll probably do some checks to make sure that this app does not have malicious code. But if you're just downloading something from like GitHub and just putting it in a folder without reading the code, you do open yourself up and open up your computer to uh, to be like to be hacked a little bit. Uh, so one of the plugins I was working on that keeps things in a folder, it's a, it's a macro keyboard called uh, the Elgato Stream Deck. And uh, that's the one that uses WebSockets I was talking about. And uh, they're like, I haven't, like they're, they do have an app store, but not everybody puts their applications on that store. Uh, so you have to sort of search GitHub to find these applications. Uh, so I found something, uh, they hacked together a Python solution using like WebSockets. I read through the code before I implemented it. So yeah, just uh, a little be, be careful with like what you're doing. Uh, I'm just going to leave it that for uh, for me. If you do have questions, I'm going to be available. Uh, ask them down below in the YouTube chat or find me on Slack. Uh, I'm always there. So thanks everybody for listening.